Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming. It's uh, terrific and slightly intimidating to see not only a large but very knowledgeable uh, crowd here this afternoon. I was looking over the list of the attendees, and I figure that everybody in this room knows more about microcredit and microfinance than I do. Uh, so um, that's a little chilling. But fortunately, we have an extremely knowledgeable and experienced uh, panel. Uh, I think practically everybody here has both been a practitioner of some sort with, I guess, David, the exception of David, who's merely a scholar. Everybody is, else is both a practitioner and a scholar of microfinance. Um, I'm Lawrence McDonald, Vice President here at the Center for Global Development. Uh, I think that everybody in this room knows that there is a microfinance credit in Andhra Pradesh. I think the question and the reason many of you are here today is to understand what the implications of that will be for the microcredit and microfinance industry more broadly. And uh, to my mind, as a storyteller, one of the things that has always interested me about microcredit and microfinance is that stories were at the core of this. And uh, I'm originally from California, and when I go back to California and I talk to people about what I do in Washington, it usually seems really, really, really far away. They just don't get development policy, except for microcredit. And I've had people come up to me in California who know nothing else about the developing world and tell me how wonderful microcredit is. So the power of the stories about microcredit and microfinance is, is really quite incredible. But the microfinance industry also has its own narrative arc. And to my mind, that narrative arc maybe reached its peak when Mohammed Yunus and the Grameen Bank got the uh, Nobel Peace Prize in 2006, and had I been a betting man, that probably would have been the time to start shorting microfinance, because there was, I think, nowhere to go from there but down. And so we have since seen more and more sort of doubts and criticism and, and more thinking through about whether this is always a good thing. And then along with that, of course, you had all the private money coming in and the possible emergence of a bubble, which is what we're going to hear about today. Um, when uh, David was in Andhra Pradesh recently, I said to him, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest and curiosity since you've been there on the ground. Why don't we try and put together a panel? I think there'd be some uh, interest in what you have to say. And David uh, replied two ways. First, enthusiasm for the idea, and secondly, to say, but there are a bunch of people who know way more about this than I do. Uh, and I, uh, I think it's uh, a credit to him that he knew exactly who they were and was able to get them to come on short notice. So I'm very delighted to have uh, the panelists with us today. Um, I will just um, name them briefly, but introduce each in turn. We have Swami Nathan Iyer, who's a consulting editor with the Economic Times and uh, considered by many to be the best economic journalist in uh, India. I skipped, excuse me, immediately to Davis Les Stephen Rasmussen, who is currently with CGAP, but also has long experience as a practitioner of microfinance, especially in Pakistan. Then we have Swami Nathan. Uh, to his left, we have Liliana Rojas Suarez, my colleague here at the Center for Global Development. Uh, who, among other things, uh, led the working group, and probably some people at the panel were on the working group that produced this policy principles for expanding financial access, which we'll hear more about. And finally, uh, Beth Ryan, who's currently the managing director at the Center for Financial Inclusion. I'll have a little more to say about each of them uh, when I introduce them to speak. Um, David Rudman, probably uh, everybody here knows that he's uh, the inventor of the open book blog on microfinance. Uh, lots of people have uh, written books. Lots of people have written blogs. I think David's the first one to try and write his book in public. Uh, I think it's a testimony to the success of that that he has yet to publish his book, and you've all heard of him. So uh, fortunately, that book is in its final drafts, and uh, some of you may have indeed read the drafts online. Uh, David, over to you. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, I'm really excited about this panel, um, and I want to echo Lawrence's uh, expressions of humility. In my case, I feel it with respect to this panel. You know, I, I was just in India a few weeks ago, and I spent uh, uh, three or four days in Andhra Pradesh. Um, these people you have before you have spent years, decades, you know, in the region or working on various aspects of the issues. So I, um, uh, and they have, um, almost everyone, influenced my own thinking. So I am really excited to hear from them. So what I want to do in, in my uh, 10 minutes is just play the role of sort of scene setter. Not everybody in this room has the same exact set of facts in your head about what happened with the crisis, and I thought that might be a good foundation to sort of tell you 
as I understand it, what has happened over the last few years and, and few months. Um, you know, of course, that microcredit in Andhra Pradesh and in India generally grew really fast. Um, another Indian journalist described the uh, growth as indescribable. Uh, but, of course, you can actually describe it. In 2003, according to the mixed market, there were about 1 million microloans micro outstanding in India, and now the number is more like 27 or 29 million, or at least it was a, as of this summer. Uh, and about a quarter of the, uh, a little over, well, in India as a whole, it looks like there are about $4 billion outstanding in microcredit, and a bit more than a quarter of that was in Andhra Pradesh. And uh, of those 29 million loan accounts that I mentioned this summer, it looks like slightly less than a quarter, 6.2 million were in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, of course, the biggest microcreditor is now SKS Microfinance, um, which went public in July, raising, I believe, about $155 million in new capital and also allowed the exit, the sale, of about $200 million of existing capital. And that IPO valued SKS at about $1.5 billion, which I know because I read um, the report from CGAP that Stephen Rasmussen co-authored, which is sort of the authoritative documentation of the deal. Uh, overall, private equity investors have put something like $565 million into microcredit in India and now are wondering how much, if any, they will get back. Uh, on October 14th, a date I remember because it was my sister's birthday, uh, uh, the, the Andhra Pradesh government passed this famous ordinance. Um, and I think it may have been Steve who explained to me, uh, the government was allowed to uh, enact that ordinance through executive power because parliament was not in session and it's then go, allowed to be in effect for six months pending parliamentary approval. Uh, it's set to go to parliament tomorrow, and all you know, reports are that it will have no trouble getting passage. Um, the law does a few things. Uh, it requires microcredit groups in Andhra Pradesh to register in each of the, the, the state's 23 districts. And, and, and as written, it's, it requires them to cease operations until their application for registration has been processed. Now, I believe that requirement of the, that they cease operations was uh, uh, stayed by a court, so they're still able to work uh, according to law. Um, uh, but, you know, it also <laughs> allows um, uh, district-level officials to shut down the operations of a microcreditor in their district if there are accusations or reason to be concerned that loan officers are harassing borrowers. So if you can imagine, you know, the state of California l allowing individual counties to shut down banks because they had heard, they had reason to be worried that people were being harassed or treated in inappropriate ways without any due process. That's kind of what we've got in India. In fact, I was trying to think of a way to convey the impact of this ordinance on my way in this morning and tried by making an analogy and I thought, well, you know, uh, maybe I should do a blog post and I may do this. Um, Schwarzenegger terminates the mortgage industry in California. It's pretty much the analogy. He just, the executive, you know, branch of the government just decide we're not going to do this anymore. Um, uh, the, there are some good things in the ordinance. It seems to require clear, more precise disclosure of interest rates, which has been an issue uh, that people don't really understand the prices they're paying. On the other hand, that actual particular measure is kind of vague in itself and needs a lot more specificity if it's going to work. Um, it avoids capping interest rates. By and large, there is this provision that says interest rates may not be more than 100%, roughly speaking. Uh, my understanding is that they, they determined that the state government determined that it didn't have the legal authority to regulate interest rates and deferred to the Reserve Bank of India. I'm not 100% sure of that, but that is my uh, perception. Um, perhaps most important is not what the law itself says, but what's happened under the cover of the law, which is that village leaders have been told, don't let the loan officers in. And tell the women not to repay. So the industry really has been shut down. And one of the things about microcredit is, of course, it's not collateralized. So one of the main reasons that people pay back is the promise of future loans, right? So as soon as that becomes uncertain, well, maybe these microcreditors aren't going to be around, you know, uh, then the incentive to repay goes way down. And so the thing can unravel really quickly. I did a blog post this summer called Microcredit uh, Portfolios or like Sandcastles. You have to constantly maintain them or they can just disintegrate into nothing. So the risk, the financial risks here are huge for the microcreditors. Um, to take the example of SKS, which is actually in a better position than a lot of the big ones, about a quarter of its portfolio is in Andhra Pradesh, and it has a debt to equity ratio of about four to one. That means 80% to 20%. 20% 20 
Twenty percent of its capital is equity, which is designed to absorb losses, to absorb shocks like this. So if it loses its entire portfolio in Andhra Pradesh, that could wipe out its equity right there. Other microcreditors have higher leverage ratios, that means smaller equity cushions, and uh, they also have higher exposure in Andhra Pradesh. So it would not, not be at all surprising to uh, see some bankruptcies. Now, I think it may have been Steve who explained to me one thing that's unusual about microcredit in India is that the microcreditors, unlike most banks, are borrowing long and lending short. The maturities of the loans that they're taking are maybe on the order of two years, whereas they're lending on loans that tend to be repaid on average of six months, which is why they haven't fallen apart yet. The real bite for them may come as their own loans come due over 2011. So there is a strange feeling in India now that they're walking dead. It's kind of bizarre. Um, so why, why did this happen? Uh, I'm going to try to list some reasons without judging too much which were most important. One, I'm sorry to say, is what you might call global weirding, uh, global warming. Um, you think about the, the floods that hurt, happened in Pakistan this summer. The rains have been very strange this year in southern India. I met some women who had planted cotton earlier in the year, and then in, uh, there were unseasonal rains. So I was told the rain in the area usually stops by early October, but it kept raining, um, and that caused the cotton to blacken, perhaps because of a fungal attack. I just saw a blog post the other day about a similar story, but with rice. Again, they were, they, it was too much rain, and that led to fungus damage. Um, and so income that women were counting on and families were counting on was not there to repay the loans. I've also heard political rest, unrest mentioned as a factor. Um, there are some separatist uh, frictions in Andhra Pradesh, people who want to split the state. Um, one way they express, uh, you know, try to exercise power is by calling general strikes. Now, if there's a general strike, it means that people who were expecting to, who are hoping to do uh, work on a daily, to do daily work under the National uh, Employment Guarantee uh, Program, which is a public works program that guarantees 100 days of wages for the poor, um, they can't work. Uh, so again, there's lost income there. Uh, another thing that began to happen is there were media stories, I think early being gave I think maybe starting in the spring, of women being pushed into prostitution, suicides, and so on. And you can imagine how that dynamic works. It's the same in Andhra Pradesh as it is here. It's a great story, and the media started going after it. I was told that when I was there a few weeks ago, there was actually a ticker on one channel, which was a microcredit suicide count. Uh, you can think about that. Um, so, of course, we must take the individual stories with a lot of salt, but they had political force in their own and, uh, of their own. And, in fact, some of the TV channels are owned by prominent politicians. So uh, that led in turn, or maybe the causality was the other way, what have you, but there was a political dimension to this. People uh, in both political parties sensed an opportunity here to attack um, the politicians in power and also to engage in the traditional Indian um, game of promising poor people uh, free things like electricity and or, you know, very cheap things like subsidized credit. So the politicians became involved, and so it became imperative that something be done. Uh, then, of course, and maybe we'll hear more about this from, from others, there's the government-led and World Bank-financed self-help group program, uh, which also does provide uh, savings services and, and loans and was increasingly seen as being hurt by the private microcredit industry. And it's very clear if you read the law that it was written to protect the government program from the private creditors. And while the law was therefore responding to a real problem, it was also very parochial and biased in its own way. Finally, there was the fast growth, and I do think that this is a core cause. It's not the whole story, but it really does seem like the industry just grew too fast. It had too much easy money from private equity investors and from Indian banks who were pushed along by what was called the priority sector lending requirement, which says that a certain percentage of their credit, I think 40 percent, has to go into certain sectors and deserving, or just certain deserving groups of people. So the money was easy, and that led to overly rapid growth. It's possible that the existing level of credit in Andhra Pradesh would have been safe if it had been reached over 15 years instead of five. Um, I guess I just want to close by saying one of the things that's really tough about understanding this situation is we don't have a lot of information about what's really going on on the ground, as it were. You know, there are a lot of stories about suicides, which I think have some general plausibility um, about harassment of borrowers uh, and so on. But it's possible on the one hand for Vijay Mahajan, one of the industry leaders, to say, yeah, there really is a problem here. And then using the same data, more or less, for The Economist magazine say, to say, microcreditors are be, give, being given a bad rap. We just don't have a lot of good data, and I hope we can get more soon. I'll stop there.
Thank you, David. Um, our next speaker is Stephen Rasmussen. He's Technology Program Manager at CGAP, which is almost everybody here certainly knows is a global microfinance resource center housed at the World Bank. And among his responsibilities there is expanding financial services for poor people using mobile phones and other technologies. Um, the part about your career that most interests me, Stephen, is that from 2001 to 2008, you were CEO of the Pakistan Microfinance Network, and before that, headed up the Aga Khan Rural Support Program in northern Pakistan. Um, thank you for joining us today. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, and <clears throat> my thanks to David for organizing this and for uh, inviting me. Um, there's a number of publications out on the table, so I'll plug one of ours that was just published today or this week, uh, uh, which describes the Andhra Pradesh situation for a global audience and also goes into global implications of it. But there's some other very nice pieces out there that Beth has written, who's on the panel, and Swami Iyer has a, had a very nice piece in the Economic Times the other day. Um, <clears throat> We also have a blog series going on in which uh, you can read a very wide range of views, including one a couple weeks ago from one of the largest backers of the self-help group movement in India, CS Reddy. Uh, and you'll really read in there the flavor of what different people are saying about this that come from very different perspectives. But David asked me to talk about self-help groups a little bit, and I'm starting very granular, and as you go down this panel, you're going to get very global. By the time Beth is there, she's going to answer all your questions. <laughs> uh, but I don't mind being granular, and I don't mind not talking about MFIs for a moment. But you know, self-help groups were originally formed in the early 1980s as a means to extend training and other non-financial services. These are groups of women, usually about 15, and uh, they were encouraged to save in the beginning, and they were started to use some of that savings for internal lending. It's a story we hear often. It was promoted by NGOs. It was not a government program. And in the late 1980s, they got approval or permission to allow banks to lend to these self-help groups and increase the amounts of capital that were there. But usually this lending was limited to three to four times their savings. Um, it wasn't until the mid-1990s that the government really started to own this movement, and it first happened in Andhra Pradesh. Like all things financial inclusion, they first happened in Andhra Pradesh, and they happened to a huge extent in Andhra Pradesh. Um, <clears throat> today, this movement has about 85 million members countrywide. Uh, it's growing fast across all states. Andhra Pradesh has the most, but uh, it is a nationwide movement. It, it does a lot of good things, builds social capital, uh, promotes livelihood options, promotes savings. Uh, but government involvement came at a price. And <clears throat> some of that is political capture. You watch every politician on the Pradesh today uh, in the Congress party or in the opposition, all factions, trying to use this for their own ends. And so there's a huge amount of trying to use this movement. Um, Rahul Gandhi is promoting self-help groups in his home constituency through uh, trust in his father's name, the Rajiv Gandhi Trust. Uh, so this is very much a, a political uh, movement in some ways now, or being seen that way. But of most relevance to us is the question of what happened in this movement to pushing credit. And once the government got a hold of this, they started to push credit quite heavily. And started to mandate targets for pushing credit out, uh, begin to ignore some core self-help group principles, begin to ignore some of the capacities needed to make this work, and lost the savings base to some extent to where these self-help groups started. So there is this sense of sort of having lost its way a little bit, at least as it's grown up. And if you look today, uh, there's a number of reports out um, one from the Center for Microfinance recently about use of about credit in rural households in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, a large amount of that credit is coming through the self-help group bank linkage. It's not just the microfinance institutions. And <coughs> so there's a, a, a variety of issues out there that are, that are happening. The total financial inclusion program in Andhra Pradesh that started four years ago pushed credit even more heavily into rural households 
than we had seen before. So the originators of this self-help group movement, organizations like Pradhan, Marada, uh, they've been very critical of this commercially oriented microfinance institution movement, but they've also become very critical of the direction the government is taking the self-help group movement. And there's a sense, as David has mentioned, you know, in, in, this, in this ordinance, it's this whole issue of protecting this self-help group movement, this sense that this is what the government owns, this is what the government backs, and whatever else is out there really uh, shouldn't be there or is undermining something that's better for poor people. It's very paternalistic. We know best. We know best what's good for poor people, and it's what we define for them. And I'm not saying the self-help group movement is bad. I've been associated with it in various ways for a long time. I think there's a lot of good parts to it. But I think there's some things that have been taken too far in the wrong direction. I also want to make a comment on financial inclusion in India generally and on microfinance institutions. I mean, India has a long storied, if somewhat checkered, history on the financial inclusion front. Postal Savings Bank as early as the 1850s, a cooperative law in 1901. Regional rural banks promoted from the 1980s, state owned. Nationalization of the banking sector in 1969. Over the issue of pushing a financial inclusion, which the government claimed the banks were not doing. Um, the self-help group movement, the microfinance institutions, and now the newest uh, next great hope of financial inclusion in India, which I do a lot of work with, I admit, uh, which is about branches banking, using business correspondence and technology to push financial inclusion. But within this huge, diverse, very rich environment around financial inclusion, microfinance institutions are, to a large extent, a more recent entrant. And in many ways, they're still a relatively small contributor. The numbers that David noted here, 29 million active clients, uh, a drop in the ocean. Uh, there's far more cooperative members in India. There's far more self-help group members in India. There's far more customers of re regional rural banks. In fact, there are more probably poor customers of the largest state-owned bank in India, the State Bank of India, than there are microfinance institution clients today. So there's a lot of diversity, and this is one part of it. But I think it's added a richness to this. And rather than this being a conflict, I think this ought to be seen as an opportunity to push diversity in the sector. It's not to suggest that anything else India has done all these years has solved the financial inclusion dilemma. There's also a very wide variety of microfinance institutions. I want to make that point, because what we're hearing out of Andhra Pradesh, what we read in the press, is SKS, Share, Spandana. You might have even heard of BASIC. Some of you might have even heard of Asmita, which is actually the fifth largest MFI in India, but rarely talked about. These are all Andhra Pradesh-based organizations. And they follow a general pattern, which is more commercially oriented, bringing in commercial equity, leveraging that with bank borrowing, pushing loans, growing fast. But India has a much, much richer diversity of microfinance institutions. Organizations like SEWA, which actually started in 1971, long before Grameen Bank, um, and is one of those iconic you know, working women's cooperatives, uh, which has been very influential in India. KGFS, a completely different model of doing things. Kashpur, Equitas, Ujivan. There's a wide range, and they're all getting uh, under pressure in this current environment. But not all MFIs act the same or look the same. And many have a lot to add to the environment there. A quick comment at the end on the crisis itself. Um, I think the next two weeks are going to be very telling. In the next two weeks, the quarterly repayments to the banks are due from the MFIs. As David mentioned, you could say the average tenor of these loans from the banks is two years. So the quarterly repayment might be a full eighth of what they owe back. Um, and they're collecting on the ground and on the Pradesh between reportedly 10 and 50 percent of what's due to them. And that's been going on for more than eight weeks now. So it's going to be tough, I think, to, to see this happen. My view is that there is a way out. 
I don't think the Andhra Pradesh government can back off passing the ordinance tomorrow or the day after or whenever, but maybe they can be persuaded about how they take it on, what they do with it, how they enforce it. And there was a very interesting article out yesterday to suggest that the very influential deputy chairman of the Planning Commission, Mantek Singh Aluwalia, had written a very strong letter to the Prime Minister at the end of November saying we have to solve this problem. But up till now, we haven't seen the Congress Party stick its neck out at the national level, or the Reserve Bank of India, or the Ministry of Finance, or SIDB, or anyone else who could have stuck their neck out. So maybe we'll see it. The chief, new Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh was in Delhi today. Maybe Montek's letter got through to Sonia Gandhi. Maybe Sonia Gandhi talked to him. I don't know. But you know, we're going to have to find a way out politically by backing the AP government down. I think that's the only way to do it. Thank you. Stephen, thank you so much. I, I can see this unfolding in a very interesting way. David has given us basically strictly the facts of what's happened in Andhra Pradesh with microcredit. Stephen, you broadened it quite a bit, despite the fact that you said it was going to be detailed. Give us a sense of the environment in India for financial inclusion in which these events are unfolding. Um, I'm waiting with excitement to see where else it's going to go. Our next speaker is Swami Nathan Iyer, who has been called with very good reason uh, India's leading economic journalist. Uh, he has been the editor of India's two biggest financial dailies, the Economic Times and the Financial Express, and was also the India correspondent for do two decades for The Economist. Um, he's now consulting editor for the Economic Times, a contributor to the Times of India, a research fellow at the Cato Institute, and in his spare time he writes a weekly column called Swami Namics for the Times of India. Um, look forward to hearing what you have to say, sir. Thank you for joining us today. Well, I think a lot of the basic details have been laid out already by David and Steve. Uh, let me talk a little more on the political economy of this particular issue, because frankly, that is what it's all about. The first thing you need to understand is, India has a long tradition of writing off the loans of rural people as being something critical to the politics of the country. The banks were nationalized in 1969, and the idea was we will give out loans to the poor, and there was already a cooperative program for pushing out loans, and most of those rural cooperatives are bust because people don't repay, politicians encourage them not to repay, and everybody, you have a new committee going to it, and they will refinance it, and once again, after five years, it will go into non-repayment. So it's a great, grand tradition that the government shovels out more and more money, then the politicians say, relax, don't, you don't really have to repay. It goes bust, you refinance. Uh, so the largest rural lending was done through the land mortgage banks and the rural cooperatives, by far, much more than by the commercial banks that went into the rural areas, or some of the new self-help group programs that you see. And default has been built into that. Uh, in the 1970s, they came out with something called the differential rate of interest scheme that very, very poor people were supposed to get consumption loans at 4%. The banks looked at the guy and said, you know, you must be joking. We can't repay money. We can't uh, get repayments even from big collateralized loans. But they gave out a few of these loans. Nobody worried about repayment. And basically, the whole thing finally disappeared as saying, this was a political gimmick, nothing further. Then in the 1980s, we got the biggest micro product credit program in history. It was not called microcredit. It was called Integrated Rural Development Program, IRDP. <laughs> but it was a question of giving loans of 3,000 rupees to poor people to buy income earning assets, which is exactly what uh, microfinance is. One third of that was supposed to be a subsidy from the government. It, the whole thing became a fiasco. That one third subsidy got eaten up by bribery before you could get the loan. You were supposed to have an income earning asset whereas most people wanted to use the money for consumption. So there was a village with 20 guys eligible. There would be one buffalo. Each of the 20 guys would take the same buffalo and say, I'm buying this particular buffalo. You please give me this particular money. That became notorious. Uh, the politicians encouraged default. default. Initially, the repayment was quite good. But as the political thing built up, default was standard. So I mean, once again, you had a system of Lending to the, you know, you have to, there's this terrible confusion on what you do about, about the poor. If you say these guys are insolvent, you surely must not give them more loans. 
Loans are for liquidity, not for solvency. We learned that in the great, great recession out here. But the same lesson applies to the poor. If you believe that these guys are insolvent, give them grants. The moment you say give them loans, loans should only be given to those who are illiquid but solvent. That distinction has never been made. And there's the political thing of how do we wish it away. So I said the IRDP was, uh, became a fiasco. Like all government programs, it doesn't exactly end. It has been converted into some kind of self-employment program of the banking sector and continues as one of the many, many smaller schemes of government, which are very much there. So both these having failed, then the self-help group thing came up the linkage with the banks. The banks said, okay, we are, we are unable to directly lend to those guys. Let us lend through self-help groups. And as Steve said, to begin with, this looks successful. In, way, in some ways, very successful. It really did spread in a large way. And then it went through the microfinance guys as well. Now, Steve hasn't given us any data on what is the repayment rate among the self-help groups. I myself would re really like to know this because it's a critical figure. Now, you know, I myself did a paper for the World Bank, I remember back in 2003, and that particular point of time, the government was claiming the repayment rate was 98, 96 to 98, and yet there was a study by CES, Hyderabad, which said the repayment rate looked like 47%. Now, you know, how you evergreen a loan exactly, I don't know, but there were problems. Even now, today, I'm told the official rates uh, of repayment for the government SHG program are between 88 and 92 percent. For any normal commercial entity, that would be in enough to bankrupt you. I mean, an entity is called bankrupt if the totality of its bad debts exceed its equity capital. Of course, self-help groups have no equity capital at all. So in, in, in some sense, the commercial norm does not apply. But just to give the idea that the SHGs are plainly and clearly viewed by the political class as non-commercial. Although it's a loan, although there's a rate of interest. I remember Chandra Babu Naidu came in with the self-help group idea, the World Bank project, saying, I will provide money to you at 12%. And he said, you know, look at all the people, the number of women, poor women, we'll give them all loans at 12% and I'll win the election. But Indian politics, immediately the opposition party, the Congress said, loot, disgrace, he's charging 12%, you elect me, I'll give it to you at 3%. So that is the competition that took place. And unsurprisingly, the 3% guys won, <laughs> which is the government that took over. But of course, even better than 3% is, why repay? Right? I mean, you, 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 get, you get the idea. So you need to understand the political culture. Now, having done this, OK, so you can basically be non-commercial first through the public sector banks, then through the self-help groups, then along come these private sector, multi uh, microfinance institutions. These guys are now giving money. The same issues are arising, that when you lend to very poor people, you are lending in some sense to insolvents and not merely illiquid people. And you will, in, in due course, if there's multiple lending, and that was a major, uh, a major mistake made by the microfinance institutions, that microfinance ceased to be micro. Now, as long as you, you, when they started off giving loans of 3,000 and 4,000 rupees, the women could repay very easily. Then you said, well, okay, if I can do this, I will raise to 8 and I will raise to 10 and 15. And then three others came in. I mean, I said, I myself, let me make this clear, disclosure up front, I have personally been an angel investor in three, of those, in three microfinance institutions. Uh, and I was asking one of them, you know, what's happening on the multiple lending? And he said, you know, we tried to go into this new territory. Uh, and we asked the villagers, can we come on Monday? And they said, oh, Monday's already taken. SKS comes that Monday. <laughs> then they said, what about Tuesday? They said, no, Tuesday Ujivan comes. Then they said, we can give you a slot on Friday. <laughs> I mean, this is a disgraceful state of affairs. I mean, uh, it, it, it's, it's a train wreck waiting to happen. So this is the kind of thing that happened. Okay. So the politicians of Andhra Pradesh, once again faced with distress, and, you know, distress is real for a wide number of reasons. You hear that there is a distress caused and some suicide reports on microfinance lending. So what do you immediately say? You can't say, let's give a loan waiver for this because it's not part of the government system. So basically you say, we'll have an ordinance and pass an unofficial message, don't repay. 
So killing microfinance loans from the politician's point of view is a loan waiver by other means. That's the kind of thing he's always been doing. But in this particular case, it has major repercussions for what was seen to be uh, an, a separate financial sector uh, attempting to bring commercial principles for rural credit. And that is the root of the problem right now. We've already heard uh, some things on how it's a government program versus private sector program. You just had to read the preamble to the <laughs> government ordinance, which says we, the government, created this great and noble institution called self-help groups and these outrageous, usurious uh, multinational, uh, sorry, microfinance institutions have come. And this law is to protect our great and noble self-help groups from these usurious MFIs. That's how the ordinance starts. Go through individual bits of it. I mean, David hasn't told you all of it. There is a definite, you know, it's a coercive action shouldn't be allowed. The definitions of coercion, I mean, I can see the bureaucrats who are burning the midnight oil, what else shall I put into it? One guy has finally put an insult. If, so in other words, if a woman complains I've been insulted, it, the microfinance institution can go to jail. You insulted me. Another thing says if they express annoyance. They say, I am annoyed. This is coercive behavior punishable with arrest. So now you may ask, why do people do this? And the answer is that in India, the bureaucracy and political class have got used that whenever there's a problem, we pass a new law. We end up with a thousand laws which have really criminalized the whole country. I mean, if you've uh, criminalized uh, caste discrimination, you've criminalized any gender violence, you criminalize dowry. The truth is, if you were serious about all the laws, everybody would be in jail. So it's very clear to the police. The police say, well, you, can, you know, all these things have been passed, but uh, we only attend to what's priority. Right now, if in Andhra Pradesh, the priority is, you know, politicians are very worried about this. Okay, they say immediately go and arrest 100 people, right? Take, get away from rape, murder, and other things, and, and come to this. Uh, okay. The lesson, I think, is that lending to the very poor is so politically charged that it needs especially good corporate governance. And you can't have exceptionally good corporate governance in a thing like microfinance, where a manager has very little idea what his field agents are doing. And the field agent has very little idea about the borrowers themselves. He doesn't know how indebted they are. He doesn't know how much they have. Uh, there has been some talk about the interest rates being too high. The poor women don't see that as such a problem. I mean, I was astounded when I did the calculations that if on a typical 6,000 rupee loan, if you reduce the interest rate from 30% uh, to 24%, which seems a laudable objective, the weekly installment comes down by only three and a half rupees or nine cents. So it's astonishing how little difference that makes when and this is because it's weekly repayment and most of it is principal, right? So, but from the point of view of the po political class or a television debate, I say, my God, 30%, 24%. All I can say is that if you're insolvent, you're going to default on the loan whether you borrow at 30 or at 24 or at 18 or at 12. So these are some of the issues that have to be overcome. Uh, there's no time to go into a whole lot of the other issues. Thank you. Uh, Swami, thank you so much. Uh, it has indeed unfolded from the immediate events to the larger environment, and then we had a very rich explanation of the politics and history of it. And I would say up until now, what we've got is sort of an increasingly elaborate description of the problem. And so I'm interested to hear if our next two speakers can begin to show some way um, out of the woods um, or not. Uh, our next speaker is Liliana Rojas Suarez. Um, well known to some of you, Liliana is the chairman of the Latin America Shadow Financial Regulatory Committee. Uh, and she also, as I mentioned, uh, put together the group that prepared this policy principles for expanding financial access. And I see, Beth, that you were one of the people who uh, served on that working group. Um, Liliana, over to you. Uh, thank you, Lawrence. Um, moving along, as uh, Lawrence was saying, towards a more broader principle, um, I would like to add that, in my view, the crisis in Andhra Pradesh was indeed unnecessary and costly. Unnecessary because it was fully avoidable and costly because it's having a huge effect on both suppliers and most importantly demanders of this very valuable product called microfinance. To put it very boldly, the operations of a valuable market have been damaged. 
But with every crisis, there are lessons and recommendations. If, indeed, the basic question for crisis prevention is, are there a number of uh, key principles or guidelines that any innovation for financial access should meet? Well, here at CGD, uh, over a year ago, we thought about this question. And under my leadership, as well as Stein classes from the IMF and pa Patrick Honohan, we put, as Lauren has already mentioned, this document called Policy Principles for Expanding Financial Access. And among, um, for those of you that don't have a copy, there are extra copies right there, uh, Beth and David, amongst many others, including Nachiket Moore from India, were part of the um, uh, task force members that put together uh, these principles. Now, I strongly believe that these 10 principles are an extremely useful tool to assess success and sustainability of a, a, an initiative for financial inclusion. And events in Andhra Pradesh serve to illustrate my point. Let me put these principles to work. From my view, we can divide events in Andhra Pradesh in two periods. The pre-ordinance period, which I call the crisis incubation period, and the post-ordinance period, which I call the crisis eruption and crisis resolution period. Well, in the pre-ordinance period, at least four of the principles in this document were violated. Principle eight, and you can go through them, but what I'm trying to do is to put some uh, systemic analysis, more systematic analysis of the events. Okay, principle eight calls for balance, balancing government's role with market financial service provision. Well, this principle welcomes the role of the state in complement, complementing the role of the private sector, but requires government intervention to be sustainable and to respect the commercial market logic as much as possible. The continuous problems that have been described by the colleagues and uh, the uh, panel members between the private MFIs and the government-led uh, um, self-help uh, group progress in Andhra Pradesh testified to the violation of this principle. Another principle that was severely violated, principle two, this is a very important one, is called building legal and information institution and hard infrastructure. Among other things, this principle calls for the collection and availability of information through credit registries and credit bureaus. If adequate credit bureaus would have been in place, information about multiple loans and over indebtedness would have been available to all service providers, including public and private, and the problem would have been avoided. Let me tell you that a commission, um, I can't remember the name of a commission, but it's a, uh, for financial inclusion, actually recommended about two years ago uh, the implement implementations of bureaus, credit bureaus um, in India. Um, it was led by Raghu Rajan, who most of you know, and who actually, uh, if you look at the back of our principles, endorses our principles too. Principle five protecting low income and small customers against abuses by financial service providers. By the way, let me tell you that there are only 10 principles. Okay, so it's not the long list of principles, it's only 10. Um, um, microfinance institutions in India are regulated institutions, but if there were concerns about abuses in the, in the region for a number of years now, are the cu customer protection rules and regulation appropriate? Or is there an endorsement problem? Well, the story that Swami has been uh, telling us seems to be that it, uh, there is much to be desired. And actually, the same principle also calls for one of Swami's recommendations, which is a strong improvement in corporate governance. Principle 10, ensuring data collection, monitoring, and evaluation. Issues regarding transparencies have been at the core of all the discussions and all the events in the Andhra Pradesh. Well, there will always be there these issues of lack of information if evaluation of success are not done continuously. It's not enough to count with some rigorous impact evaluation that are do done here and there by some groups of academia from uh, the United States. It's a continuous process that is required to know whether the initiative is being successful or not. Now let me move on quickly to what I call the crisis period, meaning the 
ordinance and post ordinance. Well, since the announcements of the ordinance, further principles were violated. Let me mention two of them, principle four and principle six. Principle four calls for the ensuring the safety and soundness of financial service providers. To induce defaults and practice that will endanger the stability of financial institutions is extremely, extremely dangerous. For once, we never know the linkages with the rest of the financial systems and the magnitude of the problem that can be created. As of now, we know that the crisis is not systemic, but we also know that there is important, not large, but important exposures of banks, to, of large banks in India to microfinancial institutions. We also know that the major providers of liquidity to microfinance institutions are large banks in India, and that uh, by, uh, the microfinance institution also obtains their own credit from the banks. So this interconnection basically implies that any any law or regulation that basically moves towards uh, breaking the functioning of one particular uh, kind of financial institutions is going to damage one way or another the entire financial system. Moreover, and this has been said by my colleagues too, if no repayment is encouraged, a moral hazard problem will develop. So I mean, uh, told us about that it has been uh, happening in the past in India, and it has happened in the past in many parts of the world. One recent, not so recent, but last decade event was uh, associated with this resolution of the banking crisis in Mexico. A culture of no repayment developed, and it took almost 10 years to the government to actually put back the system into operation. In the future, the um, uh, debtors having experienced this pro uh, process might expect similar interventions from the government, and that creates the financial system. Principle six, that was also violating, called for ensuring that usury laws, meaning interest rate control, if used, are effective and don't lead to distortions. Well, um, establishing or setting caps on interest rate payments without fully knowledge of the cost to deliver the financial and riskiness of customers, both kills the business nature of microfinance and therefore encourage further users, usage of micro lenders. What we are observing right now is a bad crisis resolution process. And if history has something to tell around the world, this process that we are observing right now will be reversed eventually. It will first cause a lot of damage and eventually it will be reversed. Hopefully it will not be very late until you know, the costs are unbearable for uh, many of the citizens. Finally, will there have a, be any consequence to the rest of the world? Well, having followed my own methodology, it depends whether countries follow these principles. And I can tell you that, for example, yes, in countries like Bangladesh, I can see that uh, the same principles are in some, some uh, way violated. But I can also tell you that I see no consequence of this crisis to other regions of the world, such as Latin America. Not that the Latin America fulfills of the principles that I, I have been discussing with you, but it does fulfill most of the principles, and no, there will be no effect on that region. What we can really contribute to the world as a think tank we hear at CGD is a set of guidelines, both to governments and providers of financial services, to assess successes as well as the eruption of dangers. I believe that these principles can contribute to assess and prevent these kind of problems in the future. Thank you. Uh, Liliana, thank you so much. You indeed moved us from the uh, particular to the broader thematic issues and indeed uh, laid out a possible solution. And I recall when you were working on these principles, Liliana, I said, what are principles? What do they matter? And you said, well, look at the Basel principles. I said, you know, they're not laws, they're not rules, they're not even regulations. And in fact, that helped me to understand that principles can, in fact, be very important for regulators. Um, because everybody has been so good and kept to their 10 minutes, I'm hoping we're going to have time for a discussion between you and Swami as to how, whether or not it's possible and how to move these principles from the abstract, given the reality of politics in India that you so um, wonderfully described for us. Um, our final speaker is uh, Elizabeth Rhine. She is the Managing Director of the Center for Financial Inclusion, which is part of Axion. 
Uh, she's written five books on microfinance. The most recent came out only last year, right, Microfinance for Bankers and Investors. Um, she uh, spent a long time, eight years in Kenya and Mozambique, consulting on the microfinance policy and operations for governments, international organizations, and microfinance institutions. Beth, you have a hard act to follow, but I am 100 percent confident that uh, you're going to have something very helpful and interesting to say. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. It's, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Going last, I think everybody in the audience has got their questions and comments that they want to make. They're making their lists, so um, just bear with me for a few more minutes. Um, the current crisis is the biggest crisis that microfinance has faced since it began, and I've been uh, part of this industry in one way or another since about 1985. And so got a lot of uh, potential crises to weigh it against. Um, what's happening now, I think, within microfinance is that uh, there's calls for saying, let's think again, let's recalibrate microfinance, because uh, we really have to come to terms with the depth of this particular crisis. So, uh, and I think the best, the best uh, little summary phrase on that was Vijay Mahajan, who's really the dean of Indian microfinance, who said it's time to get our house in order. And so I'm speaking to you as a person who's devoted her career to developing microfinance. Uh, and I know many of you in the audience are also people who have done that. Um, so I don't want to talk so much about how to resolve the situation in Andhra Pradesh. I did write my somewhat idealistic view of what I thought the policy changes that should happen in India were, uh, and you can check those out. But um, I am going to try to just keep stepping back and saying, like, what does this tell us about microfinance as a whole? Um, so what, what kind of recalibration recal microfinances call for? Um, a vigorous one. And I say, I'm starting by, by saying that because when I look at the way that the microfinance industry has reacted to previous crises, I find the reaction to have been sluggish. Um, we've had crises in Bolivia. We've had crises in Nicaragua. We had another crisis in Andhra Pradesh in 2006. We've had an emergency situation in Bosnia. So let's, you know, get the message. These things happen. Uh, we even had a really big crisis in the United States. Um, <laughs> but, but what seems to happen is that um, uh, whenever something's happening somewhere, people who are not involved s tend to say, well, that's somebody else's problem. Um, and the only way that they really learn how to respond is by actually going through the crisis the hard way. Um, and so the, 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 the question is, how do you wake people up? Um, so I thought, well, I don't know, a call to action, uh, commitment to Christ. Um, so I have a six-point action agenda that is really a call to action for everyone who is involved in microfinance uh, to work on making microfinance fulfill its promise of being uh, something that really benefits the clients that it was intended to benefit. So number one, and Liliana, I apologize for actually, you know, having a set of numbers that I go through, but mine are a slightly different set of numbers than yours. Um, first thing is to get serious about client protection. Um, we started working, and th this is what I've been spending overwhelming amount of my time on over the last couple of years, um, and we started working on the SMART campaign two years ago, and at that point, um, people were saying things that are very different from what they're saying now. Uh, at that point, people in microfinance were saying, oh, we don't need to work on client protection, we're already doing a good job. Or others would say, oh, client protection, that's too scary, I'm only going to do it if everybody else does it at the same time because I don't think there's a business case for it. But nobody's saying that today. There's really strong embracing of the client protection principles. How many of you have endorsed the SMART campaign? Well, there's an opportunity to get a card and do <laughs> endorse it yourselves and your institution. Just pick up the card right out there. Um, 
But when I think about this crisis in the light of the work that we've been doing on client protection and microfinance, what I'm really struck by is how we uh, really hadn't made the impact in India that we hoped to have. And so, again, we're seeing we've tried as we've been working as much as we can to build a global, um, a global movement in favor of the client protection principles in microfinance, but we need something that's even more muscular than what we've done so far. Um, so that's number one. Number two, get serious about governance, and I'm glad that that was mentioned. Um, certainly, a lot of the problems that have occurred in AP are governance-related problems. There's founder domination. There's concerns about executive, uh, executive compensation being excessive. Uh, and there's, of course, a lot of, of concerns about the role of purely commercial private equity um, involvement in, uh, in driving overly rapid growth. Now we have, in the, within the microfinance industry, we have, we have uh, government's principles. The, the Council of Microfinance Equity Funds has a set of governance guidelines that are very good. I, I helped write them, so I think they're good. Um, but what I'm struck with with governance is that you can talk about the principles of good governance, but there's a huge gap between talking those principles and actually doing them. And the only way I can think of, I, I really not, you know, knock myself out saying, how can we get governance off of the, the sort of boring set of principles? Sorry, Liliana. Um, but uh, the pr pr principles can be so dry, and, and yet the, the reality of governance is so humanly messy. And so we, we need to work on it, but we, we need to establish principles, but we also need to talk uh, candidly about governance issues because many of them are issues that are, are, are ones that we really try to avoid talking about. Um, number three, truly embrace savings. Uh, we've played a lot of lip service in the microfinance industry to the value of savings um, and not so much action. And of course, uh, I, th I think if the one single policy change that could happen in India that might make a, a difference would be to allow the NBFCs who are doing microfinance to begin taking savings. Maybe that's a complete pipe dream, but um, I think it would make a huge difference. Um, and, and when I think about the, uh, the nature of institutions that have savings and credit, I see that very few of those kinds of institutions are going to be doing unrestrained credit growth because they're not so desperate to stay connected to their clients that they have to force their clients to borrow all the time. And of course, it's much better for clients as well. Clients, speaking of solvency versus illiquidity, savings build solvency. So, but let's get serious. And it's very difficult for institutions that start as credit institutions to make that transition to start to um, to work with uh, with savings as well. I, I know that through working with Axion clients or Axion's partners in Latin America over the years, they just can't embrace it. It's very hard to really change the mindset, and but it needs to happen. Four, uh, also mentioned earlier, build credit bureaus. Certainly, um, microfinance has been surprisingly slow to embrace this uh, as a priority. And um, it's because developing credit bureaus are difficult, requires government uh, support, donor support probably to help finance the processes. But what's been happening with credit bureau development has tended to be that it's been aimed at the mainstream and not at microfinance and overcoming many of the issues that would allow it to include the clients of microfinance seems to be, uh, be difficult. And so microfinance really needs to, to step up to the plate here. I have to uh, plug IFC and USAID for having done that quite well. Uh, but they need to do more. Number five, learn more about debt stress. We uh, keep having over-indebtedness uh, crises, but we really don't know much about over-indebtedness. We can't even come up with a crisp definition of what over-indebtedness is. We don't know how much of a relationship there is between over-indebtedness and multiple borrowing. Um, and uh, we don't know very much about what happens to people after they get into an over-indebtedness situation. So if we're going to really 
create uh, methodologies of um, working, uh, op operational methodologies that are going to prevent over-indebtedness, we need to understand the phenomenon much better than we do now. And finally, and then maybe this kind of encompasses many of the others, is uh, my last point is to create fair trade microfinance. Um, and I, I think it's, it's now's the time to, for the industry to come together and create a, uh, a brand that is able to offer a certification that this organization does have uh, strong operating principles, pro-client operating principles, and this one is, you know, we can't say that about this one, but we can certify that, that this one is, is. That's absolutely crucial for preservation of the international reputation of microfinance and for uh, making sure that investors are willing to put their money in. Social investors in particular uh, are absolutely uh, insistent that, that uh, when they put their money in, they want to be sure that uh, clients are protected. Um, Ultimately, we'd like to see that kind of a, a certification be something that even the clients of microfinance would be able to rely on. Uh, this is going to take everyone in the microfinance, everyone who's sort of in the big microfinance arena to work together. There are a lot of efforts that are now getting started. The SMART campaign has a task force on certification that actually just met this morning to lay out a way forward. Um, but these efforts need to come together. Now, would these six points have prevented the crisis in, in AP? Um, uh, maybe not, because there really are lots of local, um, the political economy features that you referred to, Swami, were, are certainly very powerful. Um, but it would have reduced the severity. I'm, I'm confident that it would have. So let me leave you by saying that um, I think the good news here for um, this call to action is that the microfinance sector is made up of people uh, and institutions whose social motivation is, is really genuine. Microfinance, where you take an idea from another sector that everybody understands and, and transplant it. Um, Liliana, I know you have to go, but I wanted to ask the first couple of questions. When do you have to leave? Because I wanted to ask Swami and Stephanie. Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Okay. I will make sure that you have a chance. Because I wanted to connect what Liliana was saying and Beth was saying to the reality of what's happening in India. And, and more broadly in the subcontinent. And I wanted to start with you, Swami, sort of, you know, I saw you taking notes. You're obviously familiar with these principles. The, your description of how uh, forgiveness of debts to the poor is a long-standing political uh, cycle in India. And it sounded to me as if microfinance was potentially breaking out of that and that if it is destroyed, then you're sort of back into this cycle. And as long as they're always being forgiven, of course, then you can never really get enough capital into the sector because people won't, won't invest. So I'm, I'm curious whether you, whether and how you see both the, the principles and this call to action having potentially gaining any traction uh, in India. It will be difficult for a lot of these principles to get any traction. Sorry. It would be difficult for a lot of these principles to get traction in India. Because, as I said, the fact that long before microfinance was there, there were all kinds of other attempts to push loans into rural areas. And political competition has come to the stage where I said, now they not only say, don't repay, now they'll probably say, we'll pay you for not repaying, or, or some such. Uh, or, or, you know, that political issue is a very difficult one to overcome. In effect, there is seen to be a kind of politician sector that I want to treat these people as vote banks rather than as people who will become independent economic actors on their own right. You want to keep them as dependents on the great patrons. As long as that problem is there, it really is going to be very difficult to overcome. I mean, among the serious, I mean, you said, get serious about governance. I mean, you can't get serious about governance if the government itself wishes to encourage default, right? So it's not just a question of lack of governance on the part of the private actors, even on the part of the government. Or if, for instance, you say truly embrace savings, India is full of a large number of people who have gone out into rural areas, raised savings, and run away with the money. <laughs> uh, because of this, the Reserve Bank is absolutely dead against allowing microfinance institutions to raise savings. Now, on that, the point I have made is that if the Reserve Bank itself has a guideline that for new private sector banks, 
you need to have an equity base of at least 300 crore rupees. There are some microfinance institutions that can be that big. So, I mean, at least allow those very large institutions to, to keep savings, even if you don't allow everybody else. It could be a halfway house, but of course, perhaps all those large ones are about to be, to be bankrupted by the current crisis and will cease to disappear. You said learn more about debt stress. This is the most difficult one. The truth is the problem of knowledge is impossibly expensive. I can say I understand the principle. The money lender is the only one who actually knows, the local money lender. Uh, the banks couldn't work out microfinancing. I mean, the joint lending group concept was supposed to be the way around it, right? That we don't know. A microfinance institution cannot know. But if you tell the women to form voluntary groups, they will keep out the insolvents. They will keep out the people incapable of lending. So the joint lending group becomes a screening device. So that, I think, is the best thing that you can use. I do not think a microfinance institution independently, by doing surveys and so on, can find out who is debt stressed. I think that can only be done by joint lending groups with all the problems involved. Fair trade management, microfinance, I mean, if you had done this in India, you would be cringing today. Because all the guys in real trouble were regarded as the stars. They were regarded as the best guys. So if you had certified all of them, and then they were the crux of this problem, you'd be in really serious trouble. So it's very difficult, I think, uh, from an objective way, to certify guys who are good and bad. I mean, there's a marketplace reputation in any case. You will not improve it. Uh, this, is not like, this is not as though there are consumers of coffee in England who don't know enough about coffee growing conditions in um, Nigeria, right? We are, what we are interested is in, in, in the local reputation itself. So the fair trade idea of giving information about the reputation to somebody who doesn't know, the guys out there know. So I would say in every state there's a very clear idea of who are the relatively good guys and bad guys and I don't think fair trade certification by somebody else can possibly be an improvement. Uh, sorry to be so negative. But Swami, I'm, I'm eager to hear from Stephen but I want to press you a little bit. Is there something in particular, you did name one thing that you said was sort of a halfway house, but given the situation, is it totally hopeless or are there things that you think could be done? No, I, I agree, okay. Uh, the banks are financing the multi the, the MFIs, right? Mm -hmm. Microfinance institutions. I think the banks need to say, look, each one of you guys has to first of all invest in a rather expensive management information system, which gives me real-time information, which are the villages and villages to whom you're lending. Then, by just looking up your management information system, you can immediately track which are the areas that appear to be getting overlent. That at least is one kind of advance that that's a technical fix is possible there. Right? Uh, and you can go slow, uh, and, you know, the, the, on a decentralized basis, if each bank branch, which is lending to the microfinance institutions, says, look, I have to worry about my recovery, I think that kind of thing will work. That is one of the things that will work. Uh, Maybe I'm, I'm going to, because I'm conscious so Lillian has to leave, and the other thing I'm thinking is there, there was real, if I understood it correctly, there was a difference between what Beth was proposing, which is really actions for the microfinance community, and although, it was, as I understand it, totally coherent with the principles, the principles are really principles for regulators. So they're aimed somewhat at different audiences. And the one voice we don't have on this panel is a regulator, but I suspect, Liliana, you know more about regulatory issues than other people here. And so since I know you have to go early, I wondered if you wanted, if you would talk about, not only respond to Swami, but also talk about the getting the principles from as, as uh, Beth pointed out, perhaps rather boring. Nobody's going to disagree with them. How do you move those into action? And I pr presume it's through a regulatory mechanism of some kind. And if you don't like that question, then say whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the open door. <laughs> um, Swami, your statement, while you were, you were talking, it just led me to think maybe the crisis was not big enough. <laughs> <laughs> because what actually leads to change in any country that have actually undertaken serious change is a big crisis where people actually feel the pain and the taxpayer feel the pain and the institutions are forced to change. Politicians and regulators are not going to change if they are not pressed to do so. So my hope, to be honest, is that there are a lot of interrelationships with the banking systems that I don't know, with the banking system, okay? <laughs> that exposure is large. That there will be liquidity issues that will force the central bank 
to tackle those liquidity issues and therefore to try to do something about it. I have bad news for you. India is growing so fast that, that there is not the capacity to fund a yes. thousand mistakes like this. Okay. There is not the slightest chance that this kind of thing will force the government on correction course. Then, Money is coming out of its ears. The question is, what what do you do? How when, do you distribute this this, this growth? Uh, when you have a problem like that, <laughs> if there is no incentive to do it right, then there is an argument for regulation. When you don't have a situation, because listen to what he's saying. He's saying India is in a, in a capacity to absorb 10 more of this crisis. Okay, but who's paying for those crises are the poor, not you, the poor. <laughs> no, a lot of taxpayer money yeah. will ultimately and go taxpayer into taxpayer yeah. money, exactly. Okay, yeah. but if India is not going, is, is going to allow this to be happening, then the attitude should be completely different. It's not the general public that is going to be pushing for this. Then it's an actual role for regulation that would imply that perhaps the best way to reach the poor is not necessarily through microcredits. Um, exactly, exactly, through grants or other mechanisms for access. But if, if I'm facing a solution where people are telling me, oh, no, no, you know, this will pass and another one will come, then I say, hold on, I don't have time for that to happen, right? I'm, I'm not going to, to expect for a huge crisis to develop. In that case, microfinance, which is an amazing tool, must not be the right tool for everybody in India. That's the end of it at this stage. And we have to, you know, put our brains together and your experience together okay. to think which way to proceed. Okay. And uh, with that, I think I made a big statement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Liana, thank you. If you need to slip thank away, you. if you yes. can yes. possibly so stay, uh, we hope that you would. David, you indicated that you might want to say something at this point. Yes, but my clock is also ticking, unfortunately. Uh, I just wanted to articulate a few themes that I, I feel like um, have been touched on but are really important and need to be sort of named. Um, one, I think that the, whole, the what led to the growth of microfinance in India, as it may have been said, was the idea that the only way to serve 100 million or however many 100 million households there are in India with microfinance is by going commercial. Uh, you, need to, you need to tap the private capital markets and pay them the going rates if you want to really tap large pools of capital and scale up fast. So now the whole notion, the whole idea of doing commercial with microfinance is under uh, challenge, question, attack, as it never has been before. And so there really is this question out there, can it be done? Can you make commercial finance, microfinance work in a responsible way? Uh, and so I think that needs to be answered. And maybe the part of the answer lies in corporate governance. You know, Beth made a specific point in her Huffington Post piece uh, that I think in India NGOs are prohibited from uh, owning shares in and, and being on the boards of these for-profit microcreditors so that the, the, there was no voice at the highest level for social mission whereas there has been in other countries. I'm, something I don't feel like I quite understand yet is to what extent the profit motive really took over completely. It has been said that you know, the, the initial motive for bringing in the private investors was a uh, social mission. But once the private equity people got on the board and they needed to get the, hit those valuations and hit those growth targets, did they just completely drive out the social mission? I'm interested in learning more about that. Um, related to this is what I, one of the big lessons I think for me, is, is, is uh, it shows that one of the big challenges for microfinance, and I don't think the, the good solution has been found for this, is uh, managing growth, the, the industry dynamics. So, you know, I really think that fast growth was, is, a, is a core problem here. Uh, uh, it could be that if we, we developed a fair trade certification system for microcreditors, that you could have two microcreditors that were identical in different countries, except one was growing at 10% in a market that was growing at 10%, and one was growing at 40% in a market that was growing at 40%. And it could be that the proper advice in that situation is that you should avoid the one that's growing at 40% uh, because it's just too dangerous to grow that fast. And if so, then we need to be thinking about how the in industry as a whole is evolving when we evaluate where microfinance investments go. And the question is, who's going to do that? How's that going to be done? David, I thought you were going to be an expert and give us some answers. What I have is a long list of questions. Well, I have argued that we need an international institution that's like a credit bureau for microcreditors, right? In microcredit institutions would submit information about what their borrowings are from various sources and one even, could even develop rules analogous to the rule here in the United States that your mortgage is not supposed to exceed a third of your income. There could be sort of 
rules of thumb promulgated to indicate when it was safe to invest in a microfinance group and when not. Um, Stephen, I want to come back to you with the same question about how do we move from principles or a six-point action plan to change on the ground. Swami has given us a rather discouraging uh, point of view, and I think Liliana said maybe the crisis wasn't yet big enough. I want to come back also to Beth, since you have a lot of uh, Axion, as I understand, is mostly Latin America, and Liliana said it, this is not going to affect Latin America. Does that mean there's something going on right there that India could learn from? But first, Stephen, if you can talk about bridging the, the principles or the action plan to the reality on the ground. Unfortunately, I'm with Swami. Uh, look, I think we, I think we have a serious issue here. We we had a crisis back in 2005, 2006 in Andhra Pradesh. There were codes of conduct. There were commitments to price transparency. There was commitments on governance. There was left and right. And what happened? Look at the history of the last five years. There, I mean, the sector just grew out of bounds. I don't think those codes or things made a difference. I think what we've got, and Beth did mention this in fairness, I mean, I can sign on to all the things that were said there, is that how do we make it stick? And I don't think we've found a good way to do that. And one of the initiatives we've tried to take in India over the last nine months is to put together a kind of lenders forum. You know, equity investors, they, they operate on this sort of international stage. They sign up to all these things, et cetera, et cetera. Whether they follow them is a different story. But, you know, the big money exposure to MFIs in India is from the banks. ICICI has exposed at $400 million in AP. Other banks exposed at $300 million in AP. You know, these are not tiny numbers, but these lenders were not doing any due diligence. They were just putting money wherever an equity investor put it. So there was, there is now a, a covenant that this lenders form has agreed to put in their loan agreements that this is a covenant that you should do left, right, and so on. Now the question then comes, is that enough leverage to force it to happen? Because I just don't see, without pushing this issue to a really granular level, that it's going to happen. And one last comment, sorry, while I have the floors on regulation. Uh, you know, the Mulligam Committee of the Reserve Bank of India is, has this terms of reference of looking at all these issues. The big thing they're probably going to come out with is a new set of regulations, not a new law, but within the NBFC law, is to ring fence these microfinance institutions. They've asked us for a lot of information we have to produce by tomorrow on, on definitions of this and that. And I mean, the only thing I see them doing, quite frankly, is to try and ring fence it such that they can say, you either hit this this, you either jump this high or you won't get priority sector lending, which is going to stop a lot of your bank loans. Um, and the other carrot is that to be uh, exempted from the state money lending acts, which is the way the AP government wrote its ordinance. So I don't know. I mean, if we're going to see new regulation in India, there's absolutely no doubt. Is it going to make a difference? I don't know. And I think we've got a huge issue here about taking everything we talk about and actually make it work inside institutions. And I think we found that hard to do. Beth, over to you. I've already framed one question, and you've heard a lot of people, a couple of people at least, say uh, very hard to fix this problem, interested in your views. Then I'm going to take one round of questions and comments from the audience, and then anybody on the panel who uh, wishes to may respond. But Beth. OK. Um, well, I could respond to all of these critiques, basically they're telling me that I'm totally naive, and um, what I'm sort of saying is, uh, no, I'm idealistic, and uh, <laughs> I'm not naive about how hard it would be, but I think it's important. We needed a little ray of sunshine here, I think so. it's important to point towards where we want to be going, but I do, I do want to respond to Latin America, the issue about Latin America, because I think that um, there are some really important differences between microfinance in Latin America and microfinance in India that have put microfinance in Latin America on a stronger footing. And it's one of the unfortunate things in the international scene is that people tend to say, equate microfinance with microfinance in South Asia, um, partly because of Grameen Bank, but now because of the growth in India. In Latin America, the commercialization of microfinance happened in a different way. Uh, and when I, it happened earlier, and, it, it, and when I saw what happened in India, it was like fake c commercialization, in a sense, that the ownership structures that evolved in Latin America were much more, um, had much stronger go governance with more accountability between the level of the board and the management. And in, in, in India, the, the rules allowed the, the, the 
commercialization to happen in such a way that the founders continued to be strongly the dominant voice. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying that Latin American microfinance is perfect by any means, but I think that the, the governance uh, structures have been more solid. Second, big difference in lending, method, lending methods. Um, in, in Latin America in the early uh, to, in the early years of this decade, or really more the late years of the 90s, uh, there was a big migration of microfinance, especially commercial microfinance, from group to individual methodologies. Uh, and even in the group methodologies in Latin America, there was more individual credit assessment. So the, the lenders in, micro, in Latin America have always done a lot more looking at the repayment capacity of borrowers, whereas the group methods, that, especially those with an automatic ratcheting up of loan size, uh, have much less ability to do that. And finally, um, one of the things that was really amazing to me when I first started working with Axiona as we tried to move into India was how different the clients are from Latin America. Um, really in Latin America, most of the clients actually have microenterprises. Uh, in India, there's a lot of microenterprises, but the clients of microfinance tend to be in a level of people whose socioeconomic status is lower than that. Um, when I look, when I went to uh, to look at the clients of Swadhar, the partner of Axion in, in uh, Mumbai, and then I and I see that many of them are piece rate workers, so they get uh, they get materials from a middleman that comes by once a week, and then they fix the you know, they create something with their hands and then they give it back to the middleman. They're labor and they're not enterprise. They don't have microenterprises. They're laborers. Uh, they just happen to do it in their homes. And so when you're looking at does the loan have income generating potential, it doesn't. It's, it's got to be consumption smoothing. And I think much more of the lending in, micro, in, in Latin America is income generation related lending. Um, so just three reasons why I think there's more solidity in Latin America, even though there are quite a number of problems there as well. Beth, if, if you haven't written that, um, I don't know India well, but I suspect lessons for India from Latin America might be an interesting uh, piece for Indian regulators and policymakers. Um, we started a bit late because of people clearing security downstairs, so I'm going to take a very quick round of questions, although I apologize, both of my colleagues have left. Julie. Uh, who works with David Ridman is going to be taking some uh, notes and uh, we may not get to everything but I think it's important to at least have the views expressed here and David may get back to some of them on his blog so um, I won't be able to get to everybody um, Allison has the mic we'll do one two the lady next to you will be three and then the gentleman way in the back four let's see how that goes and uh, no more than a minute please I apologize for squeezing the audience time so tightly. Please identify yourself. My name is Eric Maiden from the Institute for Alternative Futures. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The um, question for Beth, the, um, it seems like we're conflating in the discussion of microfinance, we conflate a lot of different things and we don't apply a lot of rigor to what is microfinance. So if you look at the Grameen model, which is with 16 decisions, very complex social interact intervention compared to motorbike and loan officer traveling around, it, there's a wide spectrum we're, we're lumping together. I'd say when we conceptualize not just, when we abstract not just geographically, but also uh, in terms of what is, what are the components of microfinance in different forms, um, are we conflating a lot of different things here and how, what's the best way to divide those up where it's a meaningful discussion about impact? Thanks very much. The gentleman in the corduroy jacket. Hi, uh, my name is Oscar Bello. I work at the Center for International Private Enterprise. And uh, in terms of getting from the principles to the doing, I didn't hear much about who we who we would rely upon to do the doing. In terms of who's going to gather stakeholders on the ground, what organizations can be or can receive support and push through reforms and get through some sector governance. I know that the Center for Financial Inclusion has a client protection database and at the end of each country profile there's a list of associations, of microfinance associations who perhaps might have some stakeholder interest in some of these reforms. Uh, are there any in India that, um, Swami that you know of or in Stephen that maybe, or Beth, if you have any in India that 
um, you think are, are you know on the on the precipice of those kinds of issues that are ready to step up and, and provide some of that leadership on the ground, because you know as much as principals can do, someone on the ground in from the from India has to take those and run with it. It can't be just you know us here thinking and lecturing about it. Thanks very much, ma'am. Hi, my name is Ann Follin. I'm an independent consultant. My first question is for Swami, and it is if. It, there are so many. There's so much complexity surrounding this issue, but um, fundamentally, if the thing that ha the thing that has to be assumed is good faith, and if you can't assume that on the part of the people who are writing the rule book, if forgiving the debt of poor rural people is is something of a national sport in, for political demagoguing reasons, what really is a practical matter? Can practitioners or anybody else who really wants to make change that's going to stick? What can people do? You know, what good is improving your own corporate governance going to do if that is operating in a, a macroeconomic political environment where it, the system is kind of gamed. And then the second question is, there's so much that's being written just in the past two months since the crisis first erupted um, in the press. In anybody's opinion, what's worth reading? Who's doing the really good work on this topic? Thanks. And I, I think I said gentleman way in the back there, Alice, in the white shirt and the tie. Gary Jimenez, Booz Allen Hamilton. I just wonder what is the role that large banks are playing because I know Latin America very well and if any politician, and, and I'll, I'll give Bolivia as an example, would go out and say to people do not pay your micro loans, the Bolivian Bankers Association would be all over that. That just would not make any sense at all. So what is the role that large Indian banks are playing? What is their agenda? Okay, I think we'll, we'll take those and I'll let each of the panel members reply to the uh, ones that they like. Uh, Stephen, maybe we'll start with you since you spoke first and we'll just go down the line and, and Beth will let you have the last words. You can plug your six-point action plan if you so wish. Stephen. Uh, okay, let me try two of those. Uh, <clears throat> one, the question on uh, who in India is really going to make this stick. There's a lot of people who've been trying to do this. There's an association called Sadam that has been out there with codes of conduct and principles, and all these MFIs have been members for years on end, and they came after the AP crisis in 2006. I don't think it's made much of a difference. That's not a cynical comment. It just shows how hard it is to get to depth. A year ago, a new association came up called the MFI Network. It had all the top organizations in India, the top 42, the ones with 90 percent of the clients out there, specifically because they said the previous association didn't do a good enough job. They immediately tried to take on price transparency. They started investing into a credit bureau. They went, you know, a code of conduct that was even a level sharper than the previous one. And it couldn't prevent this crisis. And now maybe it started too late. Uh, we can comment on that, but I think what we're having a problem with is not about signing up to the principles, and if I sounded like I didn't believe in them, I, I, I do, but I think we've got to get to a, a granularity of depth, and it's not just India, there's a lot of countries. Uh, we've got a huge amount at an international level that doesn't necessarily get embedded. I think it helps good institutions, I don't think it prevents bad ones. And uh, so I think we've got to get to different level. I think the lenders forum in India might be a lever. That's my second answer to the question of the big banks. You know, the big banks, 70 percent of the banking sector in India is state-owned. Uh, unless one of those state-owned banks steps out first, you're not going to see the private sector banks really take this issue on. And they're not stepping out because politically it's just too much of a risk to step out. They can't stick their necks out right now unless they get a signal from the Congress party to do so. And so I think they're just going to ride it out. They'll lose the money. You know, but it's less than, you know, 1% of, of bank balance sheets. Even if the total portfolio in Andhra Pradesh went bad tomorrow, it would raise the NPLs of the total banking sector by maybe 8 or 9%. That's not insignificant, but it's not enough for them politically to really stick their necks out at this point in time. Thanks very much. Swami. Uh, okay, number seven. First one, you know, why don't the large banks, the real problem is that the large banks were nationalized specifically to give money away. <laughs> you know, in other words, the problem is if you had basically a private sector banking system, what you s suggest can happen, but when the banking sector has been taken over by the politicians for this purpose, regrettably it can't be used for the, uh, any kind of reform. This may be a Latin America-India difference, I guess. Yes, huh? that, that's a very major difference. Uh, the other difference, you know, the question is the size of the loan. Now, my impression is that 
in Latin America, these are basically small business loans and not what I would call a microfinance loan. A microfinance loan is literally $100, that's it. You can't run a business on that. But in India, the, 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 the average microfinance loan is slightly above, it's about $120, $130, that's all. Uh, so, you know, there is a difference, I mean, the big difference is, I think that in India, because of the Muhammad Yunus thing, the idea was, how do you give the poor loans? And giving the poor loans can be a very bad idea if the poor are insolvent, right? So you really, I mean, the argument can be made that the mistake of microfinance in India was to aim for the poorest. You should, and if you had said, we are going to give at least 200 to 300 dollars, and guys who can't qualify for that, it's better that they go for government programs. I mean, this kind of distinction maybe would save the situation. That then they don't, the, 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 many of the most serious problems, uh, the suicides among the poorest, would then be, have to be dealt with the politicians at a political level and not mix up the commercial part of it, which is very, very important. It, it is possible that uh, changing that particular thing uh, will do. Then said, who can do the reforms? The Reserve Bank, the, center, the India Central Bank, is keen on loan discipline, but it faces the problem of indiscipline, not just from this episode, but many other episodes too. But among the reformers, the, the central bank will definitely say we have to have regulation, but the central bank will also be quite keen on saying, let us not have politicians killing the sector. So the main protector who has some clout with the state governments will be the central bank. Because the state governments basically don't have to worry at all about these institutions of the microfinance boys. They are not powerful enough, they are not strong enough. But uh, if the Reserve Bank says, look, I'm not going to cooperate with you guys if you behave in this fashion. Frankly, that was one of the ways in which the 2006 episode was solved. Thank, right. thank you so much. Beth, last word to you. Uh, if you wish. Um, is microfinance really a variety of different things? Yes, of course, it's uh, a variety of institutions. It, there are different methodologies. They've all arisen in different national contexts and have flavor that relates to that. Um, but I think they are sort of, there are some common characteristics. Um, and um, I, I don't know that this is the the place to go into them, but I think that uh, certainly they're shared by a, a general um, desire to provide financial services to the poor, and there's some things that work better than others. So uh, I don't know. What I'm, I guess, what I'm saying is, there's a I, I see microfinance as, as something of a big tent, uh, and with some diversity, and uh, that just seems to be natural for the way human endeavor works. So. Um, when you start talking about what can happen um, in India, I think there are a number of players who maybe they cannot deal with the, the political economy situation very much, but they could um, uh, they could help shape the, the behavior of the microfinance sector going forward. I think you have, um, with the associations that were mentioned, they have been weak, and crisis is a good sharpener of mind, so hopefully they will begin to be more... Um, uh, that they will be be able to get their act together to, to agree on things more, and I, I think that is starting to happen. Um, you have rating, the rating agencies like MCRIL, I think, is playing an important role in informing um, informing uh, investors and uh, and creditors about the status of the institutions. Um, you have um, uh, and and of course, I think that the, the RBI really is full of um, a number of people who who are very enlightened and want to do the right thing as much as they can do within the political situation, and will uh, will move, will nudge in the in a good direction. You're not going to plug your six action points. I'll plug them for you. Um, okay. We have a variety of materials for you here. I do think that these six action points are interesting. It seems to me that. Uh, maybe if there's going to be free trade microfinance, the first thing they could do is endorse, endorse the principles. But I'm also reminded that the G20 endorsed a set of financial access principles that's in fact very, very similar to what was produced by the task force here. And I'm wondering, and I just throw this out as a question, not for answering now, 
whether since Swami, you said that if it's going, if there is going to be improved regulation, it's going to have to come from the national level, not the state level, where India, having signed on to these principles, may provide some uh, connection between um, broader principles of what it would take and the very complex, difficult actions on the ground. I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you for your patience. And join me in giving our panel a round of applause. Thank <laughs> you.